Okay, so uh, I'd like to thank uh, David and the rest of the organizers for giving me the opportunity to tell you a little bit about uh, one of the projects we are working on. Um, this is uh, work that is being done with uh, my graduate student, uh, Yaakov Kliorin. Uh, it's actually a work in progress, so I am going to give you basically a snapshot of where we are now. As you'll see, some parts are still uh, under investigation. Um, um, some of the, uh, some of the uh, parts of these projects were carried out with uh, collaboration with uh, uh, Gege Zaran and uh, Pashko Moka from Budapest and Antoine George, who is uh, uh, alternating between Collège de France and the uh, Flat Iron Institute. Uh, but uh, really the motivation for all this uh, project comes from uh, uh, interactions with uh, Lawrence Mollenkamp, who's done uh, quite a number of experiments on thermopower, which I'm going to tell you about and why, why we started doing this. So I'm going to start basically because uh, it's kind of an introductory uh, talk to the subject. Uh, basically tell you what are the uh, things that I'm interested in and what is the, how I define them. So what is entropy? I don't know if this will work. I ran into... Okay, doesn't work. But um, I'm going to start by some commercial uh, uh, break here. I would like to ploy, uh, point your attention to a recent book that has been published, a very nice book that is called Max the Demon versus the Entropy of Doom, that was written by my friend and uh, colleague uh, Asa Auerbach. And uh, the first time I showed this uh, transparency, they actually were on uh, 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 aim to get uh, a pledge because nobody would uh, publish this book. Uh, so they were going to, uh, they needed 25k dollars uh, to be able to publish the book. Now it's, they've been, been able to collect the money uh, by Kickstarter and the book is published. So if you want to spend 20 bucks uh, and uh, you have very nice cartoons that uh, uh, were written by, uh, were drawn by Richard Codder, who is a professional uh, um, a cartoon artist and, uh, by, and the text of course is by Asa. So there is a very nice introduction to what entropy is for the uh, non-expert. And again, I recommend it for anyone who is interested in explaining thermodynamics to high school kids or family members or anyone you meet in the bar. Or... Anyway, so I'm, since I couldn't uh, get the book here, then uh, I'm going to go to the other main source of information now, and that's Wikipedia, who of course says that uh, Entropy is related to the number of microscopic configurations that a th thermodynamic system can have in a, st in a given state. And of course, mathematically, it's, it's uh, expressed like this. And in particular, when uh, we have n states with equal probability, then the entropy is just um, log n, practically. Um, um, I'm going to ignore the k uh, uh, from now on. Uh, so, um, why, uh, in particular, the at zero temperature, the entropy just measures the degeneracy of the ground state. And uh, 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 the point is that the, the entropy is something that uh, is very important uh, um, to give, it gives a lot of information about the underlying physics. And I'll give you just one example uh, or that I, I took from uh, an article by uh, Anders about the Anderson models, uh, various types of Anderson models. And this is a, a figure from that article. And the figure uh, basically draws the entropy as a function of uh, temperature for different models. So the standard condo model, the Anderson model, has a two degenerate state coupled to a continuum. And at a high temperature, the entropy is log two because there are two states. But as you lower the temperature, uh, the condo effect emerges. You get one ground state, which is a screened impurity, and the entropy goes to zero. If you have a system which has two orbitals and only one of them is screened, then at a large temperature, the entropy is log four. And at, as you go to zero temperature, you screen, 
you screen one of the spins and you get an entropy which is log 2. So by looking at entropy, you can you know, figure out what are degrees, interesting degrees of freedom in the system. In particular, I mean, there is a, a, an example which I will not uh, touch on in this talk, uh, the two-channel condom model, where you have an additional quantum number, and this um, um, interesting system has the same entropy as the usual Anderson model at high temperature, but when you go to lower temperature, you get an entropy which is one half log two, or log of square root of two, which can, certainly cannot be associated with degeneracy. So that's an interesting non-Fermi liquid system that uh, you can, uh, there has been a, quite a number of claims in the literatures that the specific system exhibit uh, 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 two-channel condo physics. If we were, uh, if we, if we were, we were able to measure the entropy, then we could have seen whether it's really a two-channel condo system or not. But as I said, this is something that is beyond the scope of this particular talk. The problem, the real problem experimentally, is entropy is something which is, for a theorist, is much easier to calculate than uh, transport coefficients because it's a thermodynamic coefficient. Thermodynamic uh, property, we don't need to put voltage to put anything, but experimentally it's very hard to measure. If you look at the standard thermodynamics book, they say you have to measure the equation of state as a function of chemical potential, as a function of temperature. I mean, there's quite a, a very long process and uh, it's basically has not been done for mesoscopic systems. Uh, there's been, in the last few years, there's been some progress, people doing calum, cali, uh, energy measurement, etc. Uh, uh, long words uh, and um, uh, calori calorimetry, etc. And uh, so there is some progress, but what I'm trying, what I'll try to produce in this talk is a way to measure entropy just by standard transport measurements, which are uh, um, uh, pretty accessible experimentally. And again, the motivation comes from experiments where uh, measurements of thermal power, this is from the um, Mollenkamp group, um, you know, many years ago. And the way they do the experiment is, uh, it's already been alluded, po, alluded, alluded to in the, in the first talk, they, they have a, a, a channel where they drive current through the channel in order to heat it up. So this is a blow up of this region. So you see this is the hot channel, this is the cold part, and there is a, a small quantum dot here in between, and they measure, they put a, a by driving current through here, they heat up this, this thing, so they have a hot lead and a cold lead, and they measure the current in this case. And the thermal power is defined by the current uh, by the, uh, uh, the derivative of the current, or the current in the presence of a temperature gradient uh, to the uh, current in the presence of a, a chemical potential gradient. And the idea is that, you know, if you have, for example, if you just want to uh, look at the first term, then uh, let's say you put the two sides uh, at the same chemical potential and you heat up this side, and so there are more electrons on, on this side there are more electrons above the Fermi level than on this side, and there are less electrons above the Fermi level than on this side. So electrons below the Fermi level, we flow from right to left. Electrons above the Fermi level, we flow from left to right. So if the transmission coefficient for these two types of electrons is the same, then there is no thermal power. So the thermal power relies on the fact that there is asymmetry between the electrons above the Fermi energy and electrons below the Fermi energy. So the conductance, as we'll see, measures basically the transmission coefficient at the Fermi energy. The thermal power measures the gradient, if we are talking about linear response. And uh, there is a famous formula that goes back to Mott and maybe others that basically says that, and I will talk about where it comes from, that you can actually relate the thermal power. If you know the conductance for uh, uh, arbitrary chemical potential, that from that you can deduce the thermal power. And, uh, and basically, this, form and this formula is correct at low temperatures, and I will talk about what low temperature means, and for non-interacting electrons. Okay, so basically this is the idea. You have the conductance. The conductance can be written very generally for uh, non-interacting electrons as an, uh, basically a convolution of the transmission with the derivative of the Fermi function. And the thermal power uh, is the same as the 
uh, convolution of the transmission coefficient with the derivative of the Fermi function with respect to temperature. So at very low temperatures, basically this gives you a delta function at the, trans at the Fermi energy, so it starts the transmission coefficient at the Fermi energy. And if you want to know the derivative of the Fermi function with respect to temperature, use the Sommerfeld expansion and basically you relate dF dt to dF dE, do, it, do the integration by parts, and you end up with the derivative of the transmission with respect to energy at the chemical potential, and the prefactor comes from the Sommerfeld expansion. So this is why, uh, this is the source of the mod formula. Okay, so the temperature is to be right in the regime where you can use the Sommerfeld expansion. And uh, uh, so here is a, an actual calculation, a real calculation of the, uh, using numerical randomization group uh, by Costi's group. This is for the standard Anderson model, a quantum dot with two levels, two spinful levels. And uh, if you look at high temperature, uh, for example, if you look at the red curve, you see two Coulomb blockade peaks. This is the conductance, the thermal power uh, is this red curve, and you see that if you look at the gradient, the derivative of the conductance with respect to uh, chemical potential, then it's positive here, negative here, zero here, positive, negative. And you see positive, zero, negative, zero, positive, negative. So the mod formula at high temperature is practically obeyed. If you go to low temperature, again, you would expect from the mod formula positive, negative, zero, negative, positive, uh, positive, negative, you don't see it. You see positive and negative, no, those transition, but still exactly in the middle, you get zero. All the curves that you see here cross at zero uh, thermal power, and the reason is that this point in the middle, even though you don't, don't obey the mod formula, you have particle symmetry. At this point, the transmission is symmetric around the Fermi energy, so the gradient is zero. So this is correct even though the mod formula does not apply. On the other hand, sorry, on the other hand, if you look at the experiment, you see this, this uh, Coulomb blockade peaks. This is one example of two Coulomb blockade peaks that looks uh, pretty much um, uh, as you expect in theory. But if you look at the thermal power at high, uh, 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 what you see is the curves indeed cross at one point, but the point is not zero. It's actually shifted from zero. So at uh, exactly where you expect particle symmetry, you see that the thermal power is not zero. And in fact, this is the shift, this is the shift that I'm gonna claim actually tells you what the entropy of the system is. And uh, to give you a spoiler, this is the calculation we've done for that part, sim uh, simple system. I'll tell you exactly what comes into the calculation at the end. Uh, and uh, you see again, you see that it reproduces the experimental feature that the curves cross at a finite uh, thermal power. Okay, so now I'm gonna go into a more general scheme and explain to you where, where, where does this come from. Um, so uh, in the general situation, the system, you know, electrons interact with each other. Once electrons interact with each other, the transmission coefficient that I wrote before as a function of E depends implicitly or explicitly on the chemical potential and on temperature. So now, when you do the, the, uh, the, um, ex the same process that I've done before for the mod, to derive the mode formula, you see that the conductance depends on the chemical potential from two parts. You see the dependence on the transmission coefficient itself and the Fermi function. The thermal power you get exactly as before. You can do the, um, the Sommerfeld expansion and you get the transmission, the derivative of the transmission coefficient with respect to with energy. But if you now take the deriv derivative of the conductance with respect to chemical potential, which is what the mod formula is all about, you see that you get two terms. You get the same term that you got before, but you get an additional term because the transmission coefficient itself explicitly depends on, temperature, on uh, chemical potential. And this additional term contains information that, is, uh, in, that is, we are gonna use to get uh, 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 information about the entropy of the system. So let me uh, give you a simple example because I think instead of writing out the more, the, the more general formula and uh, give you the results, I'm gonna do a very simple example and you'll see where it comes from. 
So for a non-interacting model, I think uh, <coughs> we saw in the previous talk, you have a transmission, actually two previous talks. Uh, the transmission coefficient is just a, a Lorentzian. The conductance is just the convolution of the uh, transmission coefficient with the firm, uh, derivative, as we saw before. And the transmission coefficient has no dependence on chemical potential and temperature. Okay, now I'm going to concentrate on, a, on a, a general system. So we have, let's say, a quantum dot or any mesoscopic system, arbitrary number of levels, weakly coupled to two reservoirs. So I'm going to concentrate in the on the limit where the coupling is much smaller than temperature, because at this limit, I can do everything analytically. Yes? But, but, um, you won't get the mock formula in a non-interacting case with that. Right, you need that the width of the, to get the mod formula, you need that the transmission is slowly depending on energy in the window of temperature, which is exactly the, so you need, wait, or maybe I'm saying it wrong there. No, no, I mean. Temperature okay. should be small, yeah, temperature should be smaller than gamma to get the mod formula in this case. Okay. Um, the mod formula, the original mod formula, uh, depends only on the relation of dFDE to dFdt. And, uh, uh, and what you say is that um, uh, in the regime where t is much smaller than gamma, I, that's the Sommerfeld expansion. But I can go to the opposite limit and still get a mod formula, what I'll call a mod formula, which is not a mod formula, but is equivalent. It's basically a relation between the FDE and the FDT. Okay. And analytical, I mean, you can do it. I mean, people have done it in the past. It's not, uh, <laughs> but, I mean, you're correct that I will call, I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's a high temperature mode formula in that sense. T larger than gamma, it's not the original mode formula, but it's a re the important part is that this relation is independent of the system, because it's a relation between the Fermi function, it's independent of the system you're looking at. So that's the idea, that uh, the, in the mode formula, you get a, you know, this, this general relation, and it doesn't matter which f system you're looking at. Okay, so this is, you know, I took it from an old paper of mine, but this, this expression basically is trivial, it's just rate equations. Okay, so you, uh, I prefer to look at it this way because I can uh, pinpoint where the dependence of chemical potential comes from. But basically it says you have a system that is weakly coupled to the outside, it could be in a many body state psi i, and the only way it changes is by electron tunneling into the system, and the system changes into a many body state with n plus one electrons, which is j. And this will occur with the, if the system was originally in a, in a, in a state uh, i, which is probability pi. Alternatively, it could have been in the beginning in the many body state psi j, an electron tunneled out. And you get the same amplitude, so this will be with probability pj. So this is basically just, a, a, this is the overlap amplitude, and this is just the probability that you started with the correct wave function. The interesting thing, or the first observation, it is this part of the transmission is independent of chemical potential. It's just, I'll call it T0. Okay? So let's look at a trivial example. You have a quantum dot or a single state that generate n degenerate state. So if they, it's the standard Anderson model, n equal to, if you can take an arbitrary SUN uh, model, infinite U, so you could have either zero electron in the system or one electron in the system, and then you can write this exactly, you know, this is the probability to be an empty state, this is to be singly occupied, so this is uh, the probabilities, and this is the overlap here is of course just the original tran um, uh, transmission, uh, non-interacting transmission amplitude. And you can, if you want to play around, you can re rewrite this, this formula like this, but it doesn't really matter. So now, in order to calculate the conductance, I have to plug this into, uh, into this uh, expression. And to get the thermal power, I have to plug this into that expression. Okay? Now, I'm asking the following question. So I make two observations here. One, can I actually write this formula, not in terms of the full transmission amplitude, but in terms of the non-interacting transmission amplitude, this part T0? Okay? So can I write the conductance like this? And the answer is yes. Basically, if I define this function, but it is written here, and you can believe me that if I take the derivative of this function with respect to energy, I get the prefactor. 
So this formula and this formula are at an analytically exactly the same formula. It's just written in different way. Okay, so this is one observation. The second observation is this complicated function, which I call f twiddle, is basically plotted here. Okay, so this is its only function of the degeneracy. So this is for n equal 1, 2, 3, 4, and I can plot it for many other functions. It looks exactly, almost, sorry, it looks almost exactly like a derivative of Fermi function. So it, it's a Fermi function with a shifted chemical potential. You see that the peak shifts with n. Okay? So what I draw here in the red, I draw this function. And in blue, I draw the, this function. So as I said, it's not exactly correct. It's not exactly right. You see slight deviation as n increases, but it's almost exactly correct. So if I plug this into this formula, right, instead of, uh, uh, sorry, into this formula, you see that I get an expression that looks exactly like the expression for non-interacting electrons, except that there is a shift in the chemical potential. And the shift is just one, one half T log N. Okay, this was actually, the point that there is a shift was already noticed before by this paper by uh, Ethan Grossfeld and others, where they looked at, uh, this is in totally different constant, that they look at uh, neutral modes in quantum origin. But it doesn't really matter at the moment. So if I get, uh, if I plug this in, you see that what happens is that I get for the conductance and for the thermal power, I get uh, basically uh, expressions that look exactly like the non interacting case, except that when I take the derivative of this with respect to temperature, I get an extra term, which is one half log n. So what I get is that the difference between the thermal power and the thermal power that you get from the mode formula, the, uh, the high temperature mode formula, is, proportion, is basically one half the conductance times log n. So if I plot, uh, okay, so let me just say, this was an example for you go from a non-degenerate level to n degenerate level, but then you can do it from an arbitrary degenerate level, a level which has the degeneracy gn, to an arbitrary, sorry, gn minus one, to an arbitrary degenerate level, which is gn, uh, uh, degeneracy gn, and you see that this thing here is the difference in the entropies between the one valley to the other valley. So this is an example of the calculation. This is a quantum dot which have four degenerate states and we calculate directly the conductance and the thermal power. These are the blue lines. And the conductance has four peaks because it's a four degenerate level and each valley has a different degeneracy. The first valley is non degenerate, the second valley has four degenerate states. The second is six, you have two electrons in, in four possible states, so you have six, etc. And what we draw here uh, in, in, in orange is the thermal power you get from this formula, just using the mod plus the difference in the degeneracy between the valleys. And for each peak, you make a different fit to get the, the log n. And indeed, you see that you get almost perfect fit between the formula and the, and the real thermal power. And if you, for example, look at the, uh, uh, at the uh, entropy that you get through the feet to the entropy that you get uh, directly for a, an arbitrary SUN quantum dot, you see that you get here two, I mean, one of them, the X's uh, are the, the entropy through the feet the circles are the, the real entropies, and you see that you only get deviations for when the degeneracies are around 25 or so, and this is the reason because this fit, which I mentioned to you before, uh, the fact that we took the actual function and fitted it by an effective Fermi-Dirac function uh, fails for uh, the degeneracies which are uh, around 25, but this is, of course, way beyond the physical regime, so we don't care about it. Okay, so this was just when I, uh, I looked at uh, one degenerate level to another degenerate level. Now I can go to a, 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 the most general case. You have an arbitrary number of levels, arbitrary degeneracy, 
And the only approximation we make here is that we are in the Coulomb blockade regime. So if you are looking at a single peak, you are looking at the transition from n electron state to n plus 1 electron state. We ignore the n minus 1 and then n plus 1, etc. And you can do the, the same calculation that I did before. And now you can ask yourself what is the shift of the effective shift of the chemical potential because you can do the, exactly the same process. You can write for each transition here. I mean, there's a sum of Gij, the sum of transition from state I to state J. For each transition, you can do the same process. And this is the analytic formula that you get. The change in chemical potential is just uh, the, some difference in energy plus this formula. And this is, as if you look at it, it's just the log of the, basically the free energy in one valley to the free energy in the left valley. Sorry. So if we, for example, transport is dominated by a single transition, then uh, we uh, can fit again, do the same process as before. We can fit the, we can uh, fit the difference between the real thermopower to the mod formula for the thermopower. It's going to be uh, proportional to G. And the proportionality factor is this shift. So if you take, you multiply this, uh, uh, if you get, if you, sorry, take the derivative of this shift with respect to temperature, you see that you exactly you get the derivative of T of the, of the, of the free energy, which is just the uh, difference in um, entropy. So I have a direct formula that tells you, given the thermal power, given the conductance, what is the entropy difference between successive values. And this is an example where we did a calculation, again, an analytic calculation, where we have a, a one level which is coupled to, uh, uh, for the uh, you know, non-interacting case. I'm sorry, for the empty dot, uh, you have uh, uh, two, do sorry, you have two levels. So you have quantum dot with two levels. Uh, so you can go, f you can either tunnel into one level to the system or you can tunnel into the second level. There is an energy difference between the two levels. And in this case, you only allow tunneling through the first level. So even though the tunneling is only through the lowest level, you can get information about the energy of the second level from this uh, occupation, from these probabilities that I showed you before. And in fact, what you show, what we did for this system, we did the actual, the exactly the same, the exactly the same process that I mentioned before. And uh, you get this delta, uh, the, uh, this, this uh, uh, shift in the chemical potential. You take, multiply it uh, by T. I mean, take the derivative of the shift with respect to temperature, and you get the circles here. Okay, there, there's some uh, fluctuations because it's a numerical derivative, and the blue line is the exact, um, exact uh, entropy as a function of temperature. So at high temperature, you get a log 2. At uh, zero, a low temperature, zero temperature, you get zero, log 1, because uh, you only get the lower state, and you get this transition. Okay, so um, since I have only two, th uh, three more minutes, I'm going to very quickly say that, I mean, the procedure that we've described so far worked for high, for temperature larger than gamma analytically. I mean, you can prove anything. When you want to extend it to low temperatures, then you have to take into account condo effect, other uh, processes that we don't really know except doing some Fermi liquid uh, type expansion. So I'm going to very briefly say, that you know you can see that it breaks down by the fit, by the quality of the fit. This this yellow uh, circle tells you uh, how much the fit, uh, how how the fit works as you go to low and low temperature. And I don't know if you see the numbers, but this is the ratio of T over gamma, and you see that it works pretty well to T over gamma about 0.1. So even though it was derived for T over gamma much larger than one, and uh, Empirically, it works for T over gamma about one or less, which is important when we uh, uh, compare to experiment. And uh, for low temperature, we can, I, I'll skip that because I'm running out of time. For low temperature, you can actually come up with a slightly different scheme because you don't fit a whole curve. The curves don't fit into each other. You do some maximum uh, deviation uh, expression, and you can get something that, for example, for the SU4 actually fits pretty much the, 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 the real entropy, which is the orange line, 
uh, while uh, the calculation gives you the, the courses. But what I want to end up with is now, now we can go back to those experiments and, and compare to the experiments. So this is the, what I showed you before. So now I can take, for example, the, one of the curves in the experiment, for example, the black curve, which is the um, largest gamma, I think, here in, the, in this particular um, uh, set, they changed the, the coupling of the system to the outside. So this, this blue, blue line that you see here is the, this ex, the experiment, is this black line. And what we do is for each peak, we try to fit this complicated formula at the head. So we take the thermal power, uh, so we take the, uh, the um, um, mod thermal power, namely the derivative of the conductance. So we have the conductance and we have the, the, um, uh, the thermal power. So we take the conductance, the derivative with respect to chemical potential. This will give you thermal power and you add to it, you add to it something which is proportional to the conductance. And there's a, it's a constant. It, it doesn't depend on the chemical potential. So when you do this, you do this separately for each peak, you see that the, the orange line is the curve that we get for the first peak, and the yellowish orange line is the curve that we get for the second peak, okay? And in order to fit these curves, you need one number for each peak. And the number that you get from this peak is 1.34, and the number you get from this peak is minus 1.576. This is very close to log two, sorry, very close to log four, and this is very close to minus log two. So the conclusion from this analysis is that as you go through the first peak, the degeneracy jumps by four. So it could be either for a non-degenerate case or for full degenerate case. And as you go for, through the second peak, the degeneracy drops by a factor of two. So you can either go from four to two or two to one as you go through the second peak. And there are various models you can write down that reproduce that uh, type of transitions. But given the models, you can now go back and calculate the thermal power and the conductance from all these models. And what I'm gonna show you, this is the last slide, I'm gonna show you what is the model that works best with the experiments. So the idea is that basically you have two levels which are very close to each other. So when temperature is larger than the level spacing, the electron that tunnels into the system basically has a four-fold degeneracy, okay? And as you, uh, as you change the chemical, the gate voltage, the, 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 the energy splitting between the two levels changes. So now when you jump from this level to this level, you have split uh, levels. The splitting is now larger than temperature, so the, the generosity goes from two to one. So if the splitting changes with gate voltage, then you get, of course, you get this, this type of curves. It will go from one to four and then from two to one. Uh, so basically, such a change in the splitting with gate voltage has been observed in many systems, including nanotubes. And if you take this model and now say this is the input, now do NRG for uh, all the calculations, this is what I showed you in the beginning. So this is the calculation, the NRG calculation for the model I just described, comparing to the uh, experiment. And indeed you see the, all the curves cross for uh, at a point which is not thermal power equals zero. And now when you think about it, it's, it's pretty trivial because the, 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 the point here in the middle where the uh, derivative of the conductance with temperature is zero is not at a particular symmetric point. Because now if you think about this like a SU4 system, you have four peaks, and it's only in the middle between the, the central two peaks that you get the symmetry. Uh, the, sh the, 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 uh, the difference between the top, the, the peak of the thermal power and, uh, and, um, uh, and this point of the thermal power at the bottom, the, the, diff the fact that you get this asymmetry is exactly because of this non-trivial degeneracy. Okay, thank you for your calculation. And I want to emphasize again.